only come with a Labour government. Yeah, yeah. So, Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm very grateful to catch your eye in this important debate. And may I say straight away how delighted I am to see my right honourable friend back on the front bench. Uh, and that is a great, great news because he really does know a great deal about this subject. Can I also congratulate my honourable friend for Tatton and say I look forward to being invited to have some chickpea soup, some of her excellent chickpea soup, preferably garnished with some of her excellent Tatton beef. Uh, and, and may I say I also congratulate the member for Bristol East and say um, I agreed with a, having spent years in the rural debates with her, disagreeing with her, I agreed with nearly everything she said. And one of the things that I think, I hope she would agree with me on, and she touched on this, is that her chickpeas, one of the great challenges for British agriculture, is to be able to produce more and greater variety of pulses. And that is absolutely possible with new varieties. So today, uh, we have the National Food Strategy. Uh, which is an important milestone, and of course it was uh, uh, an important contribution was made by Henry, Henry Dimbleby. Uh, this week, as others have said, we see, have seen the price of food staples, including bread, tea, potatoes, vegetable oil, absolutely soar. Data from the Office of National Statistics collected thousands of prices from items available on supermarket websites, and food price inflation is staggering. The percentage change in the price of the lowest co cost produce between September 21 and 22, where vegetable oil is up by 65%, pasta 59.9%, tea 46%, bread 37%, and milk 29.4%. These in prices are huge, making the weekly shop for many in this country simply unaffordable. The increases seem to be most stark on the food staples as opposed to the more luxury items. For example, the price of orange juice is down by 8.9%. Wine has only increased by 2%. The impact on food staples will be catastrophic for those living on the breadline, already having to tightly budget to feed their families each week. Food and energy prices are highly regressive costing more for those on low income to pay much more as a percentage of those budget than those higher up on the income scale. Increasing food prices will soon, Madam Deputy Speaker, become as big a problem as the increase in energy prices, on which much more attention has been paid in this House and elsewhere. As has already been said, 18% of all households are, excluding, are experiencing food insecurity in the last month. Supermarkets should be doing more to compete with each other and try and hold prices down, even if it impacts on their profits. After all, that is what they are dictating to their suppliers, their often small suppliers, and some of whom will not survive this latest bout of cost in food inflation. The country's largest food supermarket, for example, Tesco, has made steps to increase, to ease the costs for their customers, Despite falls in profit, they are freezing prices on over a thousand products, whilst at the same time increasing their hourly rate of pay in their stores to £10.98 to help their workers. While costs in supermarkets are soaring, the increased costs of fertiliser and feed, exacerbated by Ru Russia's war in Ukraine, were again caused crisis for some farmers who were undoubtedly ceased to trade. As an example of increased costs, potatoes in the supermarkets have recently been hiked by 13.2%, whereas farmers have only seen a 5% rise this year. And I know the Honourable Lady from Bristol East would disapprove, but British Sugar are about to increase their, their sugar price, wholesale sugar price at the end of this month by 40%, whereas sugar beet farmers have only seen a substantive increase of 30% this year, the first in three years. And all of this against an environment where fertiliser, the main cost of farmers, has increased 300% in the last 18 months. So DEFRA urgently needs to discuss this matter with the supermarkets. They should not be putting up their prices more than they increase their prices to their suppliers, and they certainly ought not to be increasing shareholders' profits on the back of the poorest in the country. In short, they should exercise restraint for a short period to get us over this financial crisis. 
Supermarkets should also continue the policy that some began during COVID to buy British wherever possible. Importantly, the government needs to continue with its environmental land management scheme re-evaluation to see whether the balance between taking land out of production for environmental schemes such as tree planting and rewilding balances with the need to maintain the land to grow food security sustainably and with our own food security. In the current situation where the cost of food is so high and the poorest within our society are having to rely on food banks, as has already been said, to feed themselves, it is our duty to ensure that we can produce as much of our own food as possible to meet demand. Will my Honourable Friend give way? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, I thank my Honourable Friend for giving way. And uh, he's making a very powerful case because he knows a lot about this subject, just like my Honourable Friend on the front bench. Would you not agree with me, though, given the challenges we're facing, that it's absolutely right to start focusing on tackling food waste? I recently met with a local business in Macclesfield, the Park and Sons potato business, and with Sodexo, uh, one of their major clients. That focus will help not just them and their bottom line, but also ensure that the greater availability of food in these difficult times. My uncle raised, raises a very important point in two respects, not only in the food retailers and processors, but also for the individuals within their home, where there is far too much food waste goes on. Um, as an island nation, we should not be over-reliant on imports or the global market with the shocks that can come with that. The recent case being the war in Ukraine. In the 1980s, our self-sufficiency with food was 75%. It has fallen now to only 60%. We need to be encouraging as much food production as in this country as possible so that more of the food we eat is grown in this country to keep prices at a sustainable level. Since August 21, imports of food and live animals has increased rapidly, while exports, of which, uh, sorry, uh, while exports have barely moved at all. And whilst I fully recognise that environmental schemes such as tree planting and soil improvement schemes to stop our rivers from being polluted will help slow climate change and improve our natural environment. Equally, as global temperatures warm, vast swathes of country near the equator will inevitably produce less food, which means that temperate climate countries such as ours will have to produce more food to feed the world. Environment and animal welfare issues are often forgotten in either having to transport animals long distances to be slaughtered, or the environmental damage of shipping, or worse still, flying food vast distances across the world. The way to improve this situation is by making sure the animals are slaughtered as humanely as possible, close to the farm where they are kept, and all food around the world should be consumed as close as possible to the point of production where it is practically possible to do so. Therefore, we need, and I say this sincerely to my honourable, right honourable friend on the front bench, we need to be very careful about taking land out of production. It makes no sense whatsoever for a 2,000 acre, good quality arable farm in Essex, which was formerly growing wheat, barley, rape and field beans, to be encouraged to put all its land down to grass under the countryside stewardship scheme. And I would say to the honourable lady, whilst I fully accept we should be taking some of our poorest land out of production for environmental schemes. Equally, we should be really careful about taking our best land, particularly grade one and two land in the old parlance when I was training, out of production for non-food producing schemes. So no one is keener on improving and protecting the natural environment than I am. For those of us lucky enough to live in the Cotswolds are eager to protect its natural beauty. And I pay tribute to my Cotswold farmers for not only producing some of the best lamb in the country, but also to for fully participating in environmental schemes uh, to improve uh, biodiversity. On the other hand, everyone in the world is reliant wherever possible on a good supply of food at a reasonable price. So that we can reduce the amount of food that we import and have a long-term sustainable food policy, we must do more to grow and process our own food. This will help bring down the cost of our basic food staples, helping individuals and families to food shop without fear of what it costs, which I imagine so many are having to do at the moment. Equally in the UK, in, we have the most beautiful countryside and rivers in the world, in which we need to be careful to preserve our biodiversity. Thank you very much, Minister. Ben Lake.